You're listening to the Breakpoint Podcast. Today, Maria Bear interviews Virginia Prodan, one of the speakers at the upcoming Wilberforce Weekend in May. Virginia details how God is calling her and equipping her to live a life redeemed, a calling that extends even to those who tried to assassinate her. Here's Maria Bear with Virginia Prodan. Well, I am here with Virginia Proden. She is going to be one of our speakers at the Wilberforce Weekend coming up soon. We're so excited to have her. Virginia, I've been familiar with your story for a while now, and I can't wait to get to share it with our audience and our partners at the Wilberforce Weekend. And specifically, the theme this year is Life Redeemed. And what we're really going to be diving into is we know that Jesus offers redemption. Sometimes we can tend to think about that as a one-time thing that Jesus saves us from our sins. And that's a wonderful thing. And even if it were a one-time thing, that would be enough and it would be incredible. But we know that as Christians, he saves us to something and for something. And part of what he saves us to is a life free of bitterness and anger that comes with being slaves to sin. And I know that that's part of what you're going to be sharing with us on Saturday morning um, is being free from bitterness and anger. And if there's anyone who has a story that would justify being bitter or angry. It's you, Virginia. You grew up under communism in Romania and you had a a very dark childhood, as I understand. I know now that you are a resident of the United States. You're a citizen. And you told me earlier that you you are an adopted citizen of Texas, which is no small feat. I understand they don't just uh, adopt anybody as a Texan over there. So that's that's great. But I, I wonder if we could start today Well, I should say also, you also work as an international human rights attorney with the Alliance Defending Freedom on behalf of human rights around the world, uh, which you are uniquely qualified to do. So before we get into um, just getting a little sneak peek of what you're going to be sharing with us at the Wilberforce Weekend, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your story. I wanted to ask specifically, you, you grew up, as I said, under communism in Romania, and you chose to go into the law. You became a lawyer. Why did you seek that profession? Um, first of all, I'm so glad to be here and to share my story. And uh, from the beginning, I want to tell everyone, uh, God wrote his story in my life long before I scribed it into my memoir, Saving My Assassin. And the second thing that I want that I want to share is I am not the hero. God mm-hmm. is the hero of my life. And if you want to put your life in God's hands, your story will never be the same and your influence will be amazing. I grew up in in a communist regime. Mm -hmm. I uh, um, noticed my parents and people around me being politically correct outside, doing everything that the government will ask them to do, give uh, away their rights. And I also watch them inside of our home, whispering how horrible the government was, that tomorrow the government will ask for other rights for them to give away. Mm. So I started to develop a feeling of insecurity, knowing that I was nothing for the government and my parents were not strong enough to fight for me. But I also noticed that a fire started to burn in me to find out why the adults around me were able to understand the truth, but not courageous to speak up. Mm -hmm. And because I have lawyers in my family and they always whispering will tell the law and the right in my mind. I was thinking, oh, I found the way. I'm going to go to law school. I'm going to learn the law and I'm going to speak up the truth. I want to stop just a little bit here and ask your audience, what do you see around you that you say this needs to be changed? It's not good. You know what? That might be your mission. Mm -hmm. That might be what God put on your heart, the reason why you are here. So pay attention to that. Amen. So you wanted to find a place where people were telling the truth, not even necessarily the truth about God, because I don't know that you as a younger person, you know, maybe maybe you didn't have the conception of that yet, but you just wanted to be around people who weren't lying 
Is that fair to say? That is true. That is true. Also, you you mentioned that my childhood was very, very sad. And um, uh, many people will say to me after they read uh, my uh, my memoir, Saving My Assassin, they will say, your childhood was worse than Cinderella. And it's true. It really is. Mm. But I want to mention this. God did not create that childhood. God allowed that childhood mm-hmm. to be my childhood, but he used it as a training uh, period or tool to create me and to build in me what he knew that I need to have in in order to be the lawyer to defend Christian and human rights cases. Mm-hmm. You can read more in details in my memoir, Saving My Assassin. Mm-hmm. But I want you to be encouraged that if you are right now in a situation that you don't like or um, you feel like uh, God is training you, guess what? He's training you. What an amazing mission. So mm-hmm. learn it. Enjoy as much as you can and maybe enjoy it. It's not the right word. Persevere. Persevere mm-hmm. under those circumstances. And one day you will look back and you will say, oh, those hard or hardship circumstances really mold me to be who I am today. Mm-hmm. Virginia, if you went back to yourself at 10 years old and you told her today, that you're doing what you're doing now, that you are fighting on behalf of human rights and that you're standing up for Christians around the world. What do you think the 10 year old Virginia would say? I believe that I will say you're, you're bold as a lion. You just don't know it yet. (laughs) That's beautiful. And so you, I've heard you tell this story before about through a client of yours, you were invited to church and you went, you somehow found yourself in this church. You had you had decided you you didn't find what you were looking for in practicing law in Romania. And you went into this church and they were singing a song, Sinner Come Home. And you thought to yourself, oh, they're celebrating because someone named Sinner has returned. <laughs> because the, the concept even of sin, the word sin was unfamiliar to you. When did the gospel become real to you? When did Jesus reach out to you personally? Uh, that day when I was in the church, as the the church choir uh, finished the song, um, we were invited to sit in a specific place, and the pastor came and opened the Bible and read, um, Jesus Christ said, I am the truth, the way, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. And I have to tell you that in that um uh, it was big but quiet uh, church. Everybody was looking at their Bible and everything. Imagine that you hear someone said, what? That was me. Because finally somebody said, I am the truth and the life. Nobody comes to me. And that minute, Christ came real to me. And at that moment, that day, I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior. And I also understood that he allowed, put in me that fire to find the truth, guided me to law school and guided me to him in order because or in order for him to present to me the appointment that he had in my life to defend Christians and human rights cases. Mm. And uh, I I didn't have to uh, look for uh, clients because people will come and uh, and, and approach me. Hmm. So and and that that is the next chapter of your story. Then, so you began after that uh, that encounter with Jesus and giving your life to Him. You began defending churches and Christians in Romania who were suffering under increasing persecution by the communist dictatorship, and that led to this interaction. I mean, you you were kidnapped and you were tortured and beaten for doing that. And then eventually a man showed up in your office to kill you. Tell us about what happened. Um, when God gives you a mission, he gives you, he builds into you uh, courage and strength and even put people around you that will help you. They, you know, the evil one will attack you, no question about this. Um, but 
I want to encourage people that God is not obligated to tell us everything that he's doing. Later on, I found out as I was defending Christian and churches, my cases became part of the United States uh, uh, um, Department of State's report on human rights violations and part of United Nations report on human rights violations, which means that I exposed the dictator to the entire world. So don't be concerned about if you find yourself uh, uh, alone or something because God has his plan. So because of that, and because of the dictator knew exactly that he, I was exposing him, he decided and organized the perfect plan to kill me. And he, I, at the, my home and my office, I had microphones. And I was followed by secret police, so they knew my whereabouts. Mm -hmm. So uh, the dictator sent a client to my office exactly close to five o'clock when my assistant was ready to um, to leave the, the office. So she opened the door to my office, introduced the client, and uh, left for, for the day. When my new client find out, uh, heard that my assistant uh, closed the door, he started to scream at me and said, I'm not your client. I'm here to kill you. He pulled his jacket, took his gun and pointed to my face. He was so uh, convincing and not only convincing, I was able to read on his face the joy that he had. And he expressed the reason of his joy. He said, by doing this assignment, by killing you, I will be number one in uh, dictator's uh, team. And mm. he was looking for, for that. And I, I really believe that I, I will die. I was uh, five, under five feet tall like I am today. <laughs> I was 82 pounds and he was 6'10 feet tall, strong like a football player. Nowhere to run, no way to fight with him. So I, I, like I said, I was convinced that I'm going to die. And he was screaming. My heart was in my ear. I uh, I heard uh, the voices of my friends and even relatives or acquaintances saying, stop fighting against a powerful dictator. We're going to find you dead one day. Mm -hmm. But in all this noise, I also heard the whisper of God saying, share the gospel. And I shared the gospel with him. I recited the gospel word by word. You can read more in my memoir, Saving My Assassin. As I recited the Bible verse to him. I uh, noticed that his shoulder relaxed. He put the gun on the table. He noticed several times. And he was melting it under God's power. And as I watched him melting it under God's power, I was thinking as a human. When I finish, she's going to kill me. And that stopped my way of reciting the Bible. So I couldn't remember the Bible verses. So I started to paraphrase. But I said only two sentences because the minute that I said those sentences with my own words, he came back to the way he came in my office and say, I'm here to kill you. This is my job. And I pray like never before. And the Lord um, returned my memory back. And I was able to share the gospel, to uh, recite the Bible, the gospel back to him. And at the end, he accepted Christ. But not only that. Shortly after that, a few, few months after that, um, President Ronald Reagan made, made a deal with our dictator and to allow us, me and my family, to come to the United States. Um, I, uh, I learned English. I uh, went back to law school. And 20 years after this event, I was in my law office in Dallas, Texas, and a new client came to my office. He had a case. He explained the case. And all of a sudden, he got very frustrated. He looked straight to me and he said, Virginia, don't you remember me? And I said, no. And I was, who is this man? And he showed me his Securitate ID. 
I thought that I lived that moment back in Romania again. And he started to share with me and say what God is doing in his life. And I share with him that I am writing my book. And he asked me to let him write a chapter in my book. So today, in my memoir, Saving My Assassin, you will find not only my point of view, but his chapter and his point of view and what God is doing in his life and in my life. And how God reached and touched not only him, but God uh, changed Romania from a socialist country to a democratic country to a little tiny person like me, under five feet tall, 82 pounds, a woman that under socialist is nothing, not what they lie to you. This is our God, and this is what he's capable of doing, not only in my life, but in your life too. So if you listen today, if you hear, I invite you to put your life in God's hands, mm -hmm. and your life will never be the same. That's such an incredible story, Virginia. I've heard you say before that God, that the Lord shines brightest in the dark. And this, your story is, is just a clear miracle. There's nothing else to attribute it to than God's yes. goodness and grace and his orchestration of all those events leading up to that. And that he not only wanted to save you, but that he was jealous for that man as well. He wanted to save that man and to save yes. others through him, through his witness and through your witness. And so one of the things that we're talking about at the Wilberforce weekend is again, what what Jesus redeems us to, not, not even just from, we know he redeems us from the sort of sin and darkness that you endured, but he saves us to something as well. And one of those things is freedom from bondage and fear and bitterness. Um, and, and I've, I've heard you talk before about the scriptures being living and active, that our faith is not a theoretical concept, but that it's it's action, it's habit. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your habit of living free of fear and bitterness. How do you do that? First of all, uh, when, when God uh, transforms his power is in you, he changes you. You mm -hmm. are not the same, the same person. And you, you start to have a fear of God. We use the same word, but the fear of God is a reverence of God. You follow him and you listen to what he said, no matter who's going to be against you. And that reverence of God is, um, um, and the joy that he provides for you in uh, any circumstances um, will have an influence over absolutely everyone who is in touch with you. Um, there are stories in, in my book that they will, will, will touch your life and will prove that it was God and it is God who works in us and through us. We are called to work with him so the world can see Christ in us, the power of God. We are called to impossible so people can see that a little tiny, under five feet tall person can do um, uh, in obedience to God, guided by God, the impossible in, in their life. And it's everywhere. It, it was in Romania, here in the United States, wherever we go. And also that helped you, that fear, which I call reverence of God, to get mm -hmm. rid of fear of people and to look at people, especially the ones that don't agree with us, they will make fun of us or even persecute us, to look at them as slaves in the evil stand. And when you let Christ shine in you, there is no bitterness, there is no anger, there is just joy. And I have to tell you, when you read my book, and here I am in the interrogation room, full of blood, full of pain, and God is telling me to tell them, I don't like what you're doing, but God loves you, and I choose to love you. Many of these, these people strong, courageous, full of guns, will turn their heads because they were crying. They mm -hmm. didn't know what to say. 
That's what God is capable. When you read love your enemies and everything, it's different when you are in the position that God pours his love to you and Holy Spirit guides you and you watch yourself doing and acting and what the Bible tells you. There is no greater joy. There is no greater greater job that we have on this planet than the job to do God's will Mm -hmm. and even to get rid of bitterness and anger and love our enemies. That is Mm -hmm. something that people will always look and say, I want her God to be my God. So many people reading Mm -hmm. my memoir, Saving My Assassin, said to me, I accepted Christ because I want your God to be my God. That's our job. Amen. And I'm so glad you've written your story down for that reason. And I I wonder if, um, if that's a lesson for us in order for you, Virginia, to, to not feel bitterness or anger or sadness, do you feel like you have to forget or you have to force yourself not to think about what happened in your life? Or can you think about it still and still have peace? I, I have to say this, um, um, I have been involved in Dallas with friends and different activities and everything. And when my, uh, for years, let's say 20, 25 years, and uh, when uh, the first time they read the book and, and I met them again at different political events or church events or something, several people came to me and said, Virginia, this is your story. And I said, yes, why? You said, but you are not angry. You're not bitter. You don't, you never talk about those horrible circumstances. You always talk about the joy that the Lord gave you. It's a choice. It's absolutely a choice. Uh, like I said, the childhood God created me, allowed me in order to create in me the strong and determination that I have. Um, on the other hand, is um, you have to be uh, careful. And I will share a story with you. I was in um, in the mall close to Christmas time, and as I was with my girls and my friends and everyone, all of a sudden I watch um, a parent with a child on on their shoulders or or mothers holding hands of uh, of uh, daughter and everything and all of a sudden as i watch this i'm ready to cry i mean i'm ready to sob and i said lord almighty i will never know this feeling i will never and i i said why and then i said lord help me Help me to understand that if you allow those things in order for me to know you, the father who will never leave me or forsake me, the father who created everything, transformed all this mess into a beauty, I will accept that. But help me not to cry because I don't want to explain to my friends why I'm crying. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but you will have those moments. You will mm-hmm. have those moments. You know, they will come maybe when you are not prepared. Mm-hmm. But what I learned is this, that when I don't understand why God allowed one thing or another, a painful situation or something, why uh, maybe you think I don't have right now what others have or compare yourself. I learn to move from that to God's character, and to say, Lord, I don't understand. You're not obligated to tell me why. You are the designer of my my life. But I know your character. I know you are full of love. I know you are good God. I know Romans 8, 28 works. And I don't, by faith, I have to walk on this. And until I understand when I come to heaven uh, to be with you, I will walk by faith and I will think about Mm. your character and how much you love me. Mm -hmm. Virginia, does God, does the Holy Spirit still speak to you as strongly and as loudly as he did then when you were suffering? Yes, yes. Um, My friends and everybody who knows me will kind of make jokes. Uh, I don't know if you, if you, um, if you, um, 
have seen the movie Fiddler on the Roof? Mm -hmm. Okay. Sometimes they will say, I can imagine that you are at home or at your office and you will say, dear God, was that necessary? (laughs) <laughs> yes, God speaks to me. I have Bible verses everywhere. I write mm. Bible verses and I put Bible verses all over all over my uh, uh I was trying to find one uh, all over my my place, all over my uh, uh my situation whatever I have and sometimes I uh, I put the Bible verses and um um, like I have Proverbs 2 7, God holds success in store for the upright. And I put comma for you, Virginia. He is a shield mm. to those who walk in blameless, Virginia, because God is my God, is my shepherd, and I respond to him. It's a personal relationship, it's not a mental, it's, a, it's the whole thing the soul, the body, the mind um, was bought by Christ, with his blood. So I belong to him. And the Bible verses are important to me. Uh, Many times uh, I I remember verses like, uh, there is no wisdom, no insight, no plan that can succeed against the Lord, Proverbs 21, 30. Uh, When I know that God gave me something and be rooted in him, no matter the attack. I have moments when I have doubts and I have a Bible verse and I go there and I read it loud so the evil one will go away. And uh, the the Bible verse uh, is saying, Christ is saying to the woman, woman, do you believe that I am able to do that? And I read it loud and I said, yes, yes, Lord, I believe. Evil one, get out. (laughs) So, (laughs) yes, I I really believe wow. and the Holy Spirit opens doors for me. The Holy Spirit guides me. The Bible says that God will put his hands on our back and say, this is the way, walk in it. And wherever I go, I believe that I am a messenger of God. I uh, guide people to Christ. I'm not the hero. Virginia, I'm just so excited to finally meet you in person and to hear more about your story um, and about the the actions of your faith, that it's this real to you. And I think that's going to be such a blessing to everybody who hears you at the Wilberforce Weekend. Thanks so much for doing this with me today. Um, And I'm just so excited. I can't wait to hear from you. That was Maria Baer with Virginia Prodan, who is speaking at our upcoming Wilberforce Weekend here in May. Virginia is joining Max McLean, Ryan Baumbarker, Daniel Ritchie, Jordan Baller, and so many more as they explore the theme, A Life Redeemed. At Wilberforce Weekend, we will explore what it means to live a life redeemed in this cultural moment, especially when this cultural moment shows so many signs of brokenness. In attending the Wilberforce Weekend, you will learn from dozens of inspiring speakers. You'll hear personal stories of hope, and you'll join insightful panel discussions with question and answer opportunities. We want to invite you to join us in Orlando, May 13th to the 15th for the Wilberforce Weekend. For more information, visit wilberforceweekend.org. Again, that's wilberforceweekend.org.